Timothy, uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 16. And the pastor has been talking a lot about prayer. Um, and you know, spiritual disciplines are very important. Uh, spiritual disciplines are things like prayer, reading the word, fasting. Those are called the spiritual disciplines because they feed us spiritually. And they help us to maintain spiritual integrity, keep growing spiritually, those kinds of things. Um, so, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. But, you know, one of the common problems that happens whenever you read the Word or whenever you're praying is uh, ruts. A lot of people get into ruts. Um, for instance, maybe... Uh, the rut where every time you pray, you pray for about 20 minutes and you do nothing but, but complain about the situation. You know, it feels really good the first couple of times, but after you've been doing it for like two or three months, you know, you, you're spending, your prayers aren't going anywhere and you're just doing the same pattern of complaining. And another common one that I, that I hear about in my personal experience too are short prayers, where you pray for five minutes and you just like, okay, I'm done. You know, and you don't really, you don't like pray through anything, you know. Um, inconsistent prayer life, that kind of stuff, or where one day you'll pray for 30 minutes and then you'll go for like a week and a half without praying. And you know, prayer is one of those things that you don't actually think it's that important until you start praying. And then you realize it's more, really important. And so then you try and tell other people that it's really important. And they always say, oh yeah, 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 I know. But then unless that they actually genuinely really pray, they miss it until they finally learn the hard way. And you know, it's this ongoing cycle. But right on with, with prayer is reading the Word. You see, our spiritual life is dependent on prayer, but our spiritual health is dependent on reading the Word. See what I mean? Think of it like a, a vine that's growing, or a, a rose bush that's, that's growing. You know, it's growing, it's doing well, but it's unpruned, and so it's growing into each other and it's causing sickness. And although the rose is growing, it's not growing healthy. That's kind of like what prayer does without reading the Word, or reading the Word does without prayer. So in 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 16, and then going down through 17, it says this, All scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for approval, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Um, now, obviously, in the context, he's talking about uh, the Old Testament, uh, because the New Testament hadn't been written yet. <laughs> However, um, the, it came to include the New Testament, it came to include the New Testament, um, as you know, God gave us the New Testament. So, um, but see, what we do is instead of staying in the Word, we, we find little outs. You know, I mean, things that, that don't take as long. Uh, a few examples that I wrote down: we surround ourselves with people who tell us what we want to hear. It's easier that way. I mean, we could say for ourselves, or we could accumulate people around us who who will affirm what we already believe, right? It's okay that I feel this way. It's okay that I'm thinking this. It's okay that I'm doing this. Don't tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. You know, help me to feel better about myself and my decisions. And not help me to grow. Help me to feel better. Another thing that we do, boy, this one's, this one's tricky. We read a lot of self-help books. A lot of spiritual books and books about the Bible. But we don't actually read the Bible. Yeah, and, and we justify it in our minds by something along the lines of this. It, it's going to help me to grow so that I can understand the Bible more. Well, yeah, but also if you read the Bible, it'll help you to, read the, it'll help you to understand the Bible more. So there's that. Um, all, another thing we do is we take online quizzes to try and solve our problems. What kind of personality type am I? Uh, where should I live? What kind of... A job should I have? All these online quizzes that we take to try and justify ourselves. And, you know, instead of just spending time with God, you know, we try to find the easy way out. Um, uh, another thing we do is we read articles online or in magazines or in the newspaper, and it affirms what we want to believe, and it, and it sounds right. So we're like, okay, let's just believe that. I don't know, why not? Um, I was actually talking to the worship team. This is kind of hard in, in grad school because... You know, the professors give you like hundreds of pages to read for every lesson. <laughs> and you have to sift through all of this stuff. And it's like, you know, you, you, some of this stuff you get's good and some of it's not good. And you have to rapidly take all this information in. See, the same thing is happening to us 
all of us, regardless of whether you're in grad school or not. You know, you've got the news that is saying stuff. You know, online social media is saying stuff. People on our phones are saying stuff. Our friends and family are saying stuff. We're having a lot of people saying stuff. Just a lot of information is going through our brain at all times, even when we don't even pay attention. When we're listening to music, just zoning out, there's still information that our that our brain is processing that tells us how how we should respond. So it's kind of like this, this constant barrage. Um, and so we don't listen to good advice, and especially don't listen to good advice if it offends us. And we kind of just separate ourselves from that. Which takes us down to the next chapter, starting in verse, um, really the next verse, it's verse one of chapter four. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to, uh, uh, to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound, uh, uh, sound teaching, but having titch, uh, itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Basically surrounding myself with people that I want to listen to. Uh, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into the myths. Pay attention to that part. Pay, instead of paying attention to the truth, just paying attention to the myths. Okay. And then verse 5, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfilling ministry. Keep your eyes ahead here. Um, so, you know, one of the big things about, and that's what we're talking about tonight, stay in the Word. But one of the big things about the Word is, you know, it addresses our, our life questions, it addresses uh, life decisions. You know, there's entire books that deal with stuff. You know, Song of Solomon, the whole book deals with love. The whole book. You know, Psalms, a lot of it deals with how, how can I worship God when things just aren't fair? Job, why do righteous people have to suffer? <laughs> Proverbs, how should, I, how should I live my daily life? So, I mean, genuine questions that people have. What is the meaning of life? Ecclesiastes. So, I mean, the Bible has all kinds of answers for us, but the problem is, is sometimes it gets a little bit difficult to understand, and so instead of kind of pushing through, we, we kind of ease off and let other people do the studying for us. Yeah. So I want to kind of put this to you a different way. When you do that, basically what you're doing is you're saying, let me tell you a story. God saved these people from, from Egypt called the Israelites. And when he brought them out, he brought them to this mountain called Mount Sinai. He was going to give them, give them this law so that they could know how to have how to how to start their society around him okay and one of the things that happened is, is god spoke and it was so powerful and so frightening that, that, that the israelites said this to, to the person who was leading them, moses they said moses you go talk to god and we'll do whatever he says just kind of don't make us talk to him again that was really scary okay and basically that's what we do when we don't read the word we're saying i don't really want to know god personally I, you know, either have more important things to do, I'm scared to hear from him, um, a lot of different things that we, that we tell ourselves. Um, so we're going to look at some of the things that we want to believe, and sometimes our, you know, our culture tells us to believe them, but they aren't actually true. And the first thing I want to look at is karma. Over 70% of the population believes in karma, but the thing is, I don't think that people actually know what karma is. Karma is basically what goes around comes around. That's what people think. Okay, what, what you reap, you will sow. Okay, that sounds right, but that's not really the idea of karma. Uh, basically, it's those who hurt you will eventually get hurt, and hopefully you can watch, but it's the belief that we can do in life impacts our next life. And if you suffer now, it's because you lived wrong in your last life. And you're going through this constant process of trying to do better so that you can earn your salvation. That's what karma actually is. See, a lot of people say that they believe karma, but they actually don't really believe in karma. Um, so, you know, obviously we have a few different problems with that. People suffer for things when they don't deserve it. Jesus, for instance. Um, he was not a Christ, he was the Christ, and he died and suffered when he didn't deserve it. See what I mean? Like, un unfair things happen in life. Um, we were created in our mother's room. We weren't like hanging out in heaven and then God put us in, our, in a body. We weren't uh, in a previous life before now. We have one life. Um, and we're going to look at a few passages about this, but um, you know, there is kind of the idea in scripture that we do reap what we sow, but here's the thing. 
a lot of times in life, there'll be people who deserve punishment that won't ever see it in this life. And that's not fair, but that's how it is. And other people may deserve great blessings and never get to see them. That's just part of life. You know, in, in, in the real world, you have infants dying before they're even toddlers. You have, you know, unfair things that happen. You have people getting raped and killed. I mean, that's just, that's what happens in the real world. You know what I mean? Unfair things. And it's easier to believe in an idea like karma, but the Bible doesn't validate that. Basically, I can rest in peace knowing that this person wronged me because in their next life, they're going to have it worse. Well, that's not really how it works, though. So Psalm, Psalm 73, 3. And I, my purpose here is to show you how relevant the Bible is and how it really does address the things that we're going through. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You see what he just said? The wicked were prospering. Okay, so the wicked do prosper sometimes, and that is unfair. Proverbs 24, 17. And it says this. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. And that's kind of a theme throughout the Bible. Well, you, you expect me to forgive people who have molested children. You expect me to forgive people who are living in sin, who have killed people in, in drunk driving, who have, who have done all these wrong, bad things. Something we have to learn to accept in life is that we don't have the right to carry a burden. Because we sinned against God, and God died on our behalf. And with that purchase, we forsook any right that we had to get angry. And so we just have to turn it over to God and trust that he knows what's up. I mean, we, we've given up that responsibility. We don't have the right to carry that, that hurt anymore. Okay, well, our life is not our own. We've been bought with a price. And then Luke chapter 6, verse 28. I'm not saying there's no such thing as justice. I'm not saying that at all. Luke chapter 6, verse 28 says this. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who abuse you. That's kind of the idea of karma there. But karma isn't really the only idea there. It also carries the idea of reincarnation. Um, so the second thing there that I want to talk about that, that our culture tells us to believe in, and, and we want to believe a lot of times, is reincarnation. Or the idea that everyone's going to be saved. It's called universal salvation. That there, there is no hell, there is no you know, eternal punishment. But the Bible doesn't say that at all. Hebrews 9.27, for instance, says that it is appointed to man once to live, wants to die, and then the judgment. There's no such thing as reincarnation according to the Bible. It's a one life kind of deal. And as far as, well, is there is there a hell? Is there an eternal punishment? Is there, you know, that kind of idea? Well, let's flip over to Matthew chapter 25, going through verse 45 through 46, and it says this. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? I'm sorry, I'm in 24. Let's go to the right chapter, Matthew 25. Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to me, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Then these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So, I, I mean, this isn't just the only example here. The Bible is full of this. There's, there, We have one life, and after that one life is an eternity in either life or in hell. The Bible is absolutely clear on this. We can't let what the media tells us about things to determine what we see as true. But what about, this is another one I hear. Our, our beliefs don't really matter. Where I choose to believe doesn't matter. I, I've worded it a little bit differently up here. I put, uh, if you go, uh, I can believe whatever I want. Our, our beliefs don't affect us, right? I can, I, it doesn't matter if I don't think that Jesus is really God. That doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't really matter if I think that when kids die, they, they become angels. It doesn't matter all these things that I believe. I can believe whatever I choose to believe. But that's not really what the Bible says either. If you look at uh, St. Timothy, chapter 3, 
And once again, the idea here is, is the Bible addresses these things. If we would just dig in there, we'll, we'll find the answers to our, to our questions. Saint Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 8. But understand this, that in the last days will come uh, times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, uh, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, playing the part, looking real good, but denying its power, not really letting God in their heart. They look godly, but they're dead. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. Men corrupt, I mean, I'm sorry, right there. Uh, so these men also opposed the truth, the idea of our minds. Um, and I'm going to give you some more examples too. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Again, what we, what we believe does matter. 1 John chapter 3, verse 15. This is why it's important that we let God's God speak to us and let him change our heart. First John um, 3.15 Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Basically, you can't be a Christian if you, if you hate someone in your heart. Chapter 4.2 By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So again, it matters what we believe. Uh, then... Uh, John chapter 3, not 1st John, the, the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 3. Verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Did you catch that? He said, whoever believes, belief in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not, what? Does not believe? No, whoever does not obey. See, it does matter what our beliefs are. The contrast is believing in God with obeying Him. In other words, from your belief will come your obedience. Our beliefs do matter. It does matter the things that we believe. Um, another thing that we tell ourselves, cussing isn't a big deal. You know, the things that come out of my mouth is really not a big deal. You know, it doesn't hurt people, it doesn't whatever. Well, let's look at what the Bible actually says about these things. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, for instance. And I'm not, re I'm not listing all these things to, to beat people up. I'm saying when we have questions, the Bible answers our questions. But we have to read it. Colossians chapter 3, 5 through 7 says, But put to death, therefore, what is earthly to you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them. So did you catch that there? Put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, immorality impurity, passion, evil desire, on account of these, the wrath of God is, is coming. Now, that might not sound, because this is the ESV, it didn't, doesn't translate exactly where you kind of get, where maybe he's not really talking about what we say. So let's go to Ephesians, and that will, you'll see what I'm saying here. Ephesians 4, 29. And read that in a few different translations, and you kind of get the idea of what he's saying. Ephesians 4, 29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Uh, Philippians talks about um, taking on the things that are good and noble. Um, James chapter 3, verse 10 uh, it goes on this kind of lengthy um, uh, section talking about how destructive the tongue can be. And one of the things that he says in James 3.10, From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. And then in Matthew 12.36, I'm not going to turn there, but he basically says, um, every word that you utter, you're going to have to give an account for in the end. 
So I think that the things that we say do matter. Uh, what are the other, another thing that people say? These next two one. You can go to the next two, actually, not just the next one. The truth is relative, or the Bible is open to my own interpretation. We go to the next one, too. Uh, truth is what I want it to be. The Bible means something different to everyone. It may mean that to you, but that's not what it means to me. Well, let's, let's look at that. Uh, first off, if, if truth is relative to you, in other words, truth is what you want it to be, what you interpret it to mean, then that means it really isn't true, isn't it? Isn't it? If, if truth is something that we can change according to our own preference, then it's not really truth. You know what I mean? Either we are on earth or we are not on earth. Either there is a speed limit or there isn't a speed limit. There's not a yes and a no. So I mean, truth can't be relative if it's actually truth. Um, no matter how much I believe that the physical world is an illusion, if I jump off a bridge, I'm going to die. No matter how much I believe that I can fly a plane, that doesn't change reality. I can't fly a plane. I would not get on a plane with me if I was the pilot. If, 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 if I was you guys and I was the pilot, I wouldn't get on that plane, guys. It's not safe. Because it doesn't matter how much I believe that I can fly a plane. The truth is I don't know how to fly a plane. See, the Bible doesn't mean what I want it to mean, or, or it doesn't mean what it means to me. The Bible means something. We have to read it and study it to find out what it means. Does that make sense? So I, I, I kind of get this one a lot. People, you know, and th this is obvious throughout the whole Bible. You know, when Moses came down off the mountain with the law, he didn't come with a different law for each, each, each Israelite. He came down with one law, and all the Israelites had to follow it. I mean, it's not relative to the individual. James chapter 2, verse 10 says this, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become accountable for all of it. But I don't think that that law applies to me. I don't think that that law is wrong. Well, it doesn't matter. Truth is truth. See what I mean? There is no yes and no. It's either yes or no. And that's hard to get because everything in our culture tells us that there is no line. You set the rules. You decide what's right and wrong. You go your own way. You just get whatever you want to believe and you just leave the rest alone. You know what I mean? Don't just ignore everything that hurts your feelings. And that's got to be the worst advice in the world. If there was a sharp curve on, on a mountain road, and, and the sign says, hey, sharp curve, slow down. Would you speed up and go over the cliff? No, that's just, it's foolish. That's a, you wouldn't do that. It's the same thing with truth. This is truth, and we have to compare it with what the word actually says. Um, so make sure you're not just trying to justify something that you want to do. Make sure that you're testing your life according to the truth of the word. Second Timothy uh, 2.15. Says, um, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has not no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And then again in chapter four, verse four. And will um, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Again, I just I read that part earlier in the ser in the service, so I'm not going to repeat the whole thing again. But it starts there in the beginning of chapter 4. But then here in chapter four, in verse 4, he says, And we'll turn away from listening to the truth. From the truth. Not a truth. The truth. You know, one of the things with the New Age belief and the Hinduist belief is that there's not one Savior. There's many Saviors, and every so often we get a new Savior. Well, that's just not true. There was It was one and done. I mean, 2,000 years ago that Savior came, and... That's the only sufficient sacrifice for our sins. Amen. We don't have to work towards anything. We have to believe in the name above every name. That's Jesus Christ. That's the way to salvation. Not a way to salvation, the way to salvation. Jesus himself claimed this, that there was only one way, and that he was it. See what I mean? I think that that's kind of important because if people are saying that there's many Christs, then that one Christ was either a liar or just straight up crazy, and he wasn't really the Christ. See what I mean? It, it, the message has to stay consistent. Either he is the way or he isn't the way. So another thing we tell ourselves, if it looks, sounds, or feels right, it is. That's just how it is. If it looks, feels, or sounds right, it is. It is. It's right. Because my feelings decide what's true. Um, it, or if we see a, a sign or a miracle, that's the stamp of God's approval. But 1 John 4.1 actually contradicts that too. 
We can't pay attention to what sounds right. Did you know that demons will often speak through things? And you know that demons lie about things? They may tell you, oh, this is your dead, your dead relative speaking to you. But we know that we can't actually communicate with our dead relatives. We're communicating with the demon. And that demon will lie to us to make us feel better about something. But that's not actually them that we're talking to. First uh, John 4.1 says this, Believe, do not, um, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Uh, the books of Kings record an incident where, where the king just wanted, he just wanted to feel like God was on his page, right? So he pays all these prophets to give, to give a false prophecy about how he's doing the right thing. And then one of his friends says, okay, how about this? Is there not one single prophet who will give the actual word of God? And so they go and get this other prophet, and he says, oh, no, yeah, go ahead, go in victory. And the king says, I know you're being sarcastic. Knock it off and tell me what God actually said. And so the prophet says, you're going to die. This is bad. Don't, don't do this. This is a terrible idea. And then he says, see, this is why I never listen to this guy. He never says anything that I want. That, that's, he never makes me look good. He always makes, makes me look kind of, like, like an idiot. So I mean, like, this is something that's all throughout. It's not about feelings. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, 1 through 2, again, we have an example of how it's not all about what something looks like. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, so we're talking about miracles here, some great thing, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, it happens. He does mighty works around among you. It feels right. This really seems like the right thing to do. And if he says, let us go after other gods, ooh, a contradiction against the word. See, everything that a prophet says has to line up with the word. And pastors talked about this to a great deal on Wednesday night, so I really don't want to spend too much time. But the moral of the story here is it's not all about whether it looks, sounds, or feels right. It matters if it is right. It matters if it is right. Um, the power is within, and within me. I just have to find my inner peace. Go to that next one there, buddy. You're going to have to go a few more. Keep going. Peace is found within, within me. And the next one. I have the power. I got the power. Um, and this is just so much not true. We like to feel like we're the final authority. Like we're really the, the cat's meow. You know, we can figure out our own problems. We can resolve it all our own. We can find that inner peace and tap into it. And that's all. No. No, no. Peace is found through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you get that power in the presence? You spend time in prayer. You spend time in the Word. And God will answer those who seek Him. Ephesians 2, 8, through this, um, actually just 2, 8 says this. Says this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Once again, it is the gift of God. It's not something you conjure in and of yourself. It's not by your works. It is the gift of God. St. Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. So the comfort doesn't come from us? No. It comes from God, who gives it to us, so that we can then help other people. See how that works? It's a, it's a, it's a process that the Holy Spirit starts. Um, chapter 3, uh, verse 5 through 6 of the same book, so just a few pages over there, says, uh, Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. We aren't sufficient in ourselves. The peace doesn't come from us. But our sufficiency is from God. Verse 6, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, and not of the letter, uh, uh, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And then uh, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, I'm not going to turn there, but it says, um, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understandings. Acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways, and he will make your path straight. That's what, that's what it says. That you can turn, turn there for yourself if you want. But the idea here, very simple, the power is, power is not from within me. We cannot solve all of our own problems. We need to trust in the Lord, and he will show the way. Another thing that we tell, 
Uh, we can figure out when the world will end by planet alignment, by some prophecy that you hear, or by hidden codes in the Bible, or by some other means. Uh, as you guys know, this happened again yesterday. Wait, it's Sunday? Yeah, it was yesterday. Uh, it, my, my birthday, my, not my birthday, my wedding was supposed to be um, the end of the world. Uh, uh, I'm blanking. May 21st, 2011, that was supposed to be the end of the world. 2012 was supposed to be the end of the world. Uh, Y2K was supposed to be the end of the world. But the truth is, the Bible affirms everywhere that nobody will ever know the hour or even the day or the week or the month. It's just, no. You, just no. And any time that you hear someone say something about, oh, this is going to be the end, this is going to be the end, write it off. Because Jesus himself said, no man knows the hour. I think what he meant is nobody can figure that out. He said that. In fact, 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 4, I think, let me check. No, 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says this. Now concerning the times and the seasons of the end, uh, brothers, you have no need to have, uh, to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, as labor pains will come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. See what I mean? Like, is it... Without getting too much into it, the thing with the... With the Eclipses and all that stuff. I'm not really going to get into that because I don't really want to offend people. That's not my point, my purpose. But sometimes things just happen, and sometimes it is a sign from God. So make sure that unless there's a divine word from the Lord, that you don't hop on the train just because everybody else is. Without really picking a side on that issue, the Bible says we can't know the time. Okay. And every time it talks about signs in the sky and everything, it's usually talking about in the time of the tribulation, after the rapture. Some some of those things will happen before the rapture, but you know, once again, I don't want to get too far off here on that. But yeah, or I'm just gonna move ahead. I really don't want to. I'm really trying not to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm just trying to give you peace. You don't have to get scared because everybody else gets scared. You, know, you remember Y2K? You guys remember that? Yeah. Everybody's freaking out. I remember I was oblivious to it until it, it, it was like December like 20th or something like that. And somebody said, are you scared about Y2K? And I was like, should I be? <laughs> I didn't know I was supposed to be scared. And I was a little kid, so I was like, well, I am now. <laughs> you, you know, I was like nine or something like that. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. I thought I was supposed to be scared, so I was scared. You know, and then, yeah. But, you know, once again, if we read the word, we'll be surprised that it has a lot to talk about our actual situations that we're going through. And the last thing that I wanted to point out I need to separate myself from people who upset me. If there's somebody who, who irritates me, if there's someone who just uh, distracts me spiritually, if there's someone who's just not good for me, honey, you just let them go. Well, let's look at what the Bible actually says about that. Um, Ephesians uh, 4, 1 through 3 says this. And you know, I do want to say this. Our lives as Christians is not all about us. Really, it's not all about us. If your entire theology revolves around what makes you feel good, you will never grow as a Christian, and you will fight the same struggle over and over again until you're ready to listen to what God's trying to tell you. Luckily for you, God is the God of second chances. Amen. So, Yay. good for you, right? Good news. Ephesians chapter 4, verse one through, uh, verses 1 through 3 says, I therefore, a prisoner uh, for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, how far did I want to go? I wanted to go down to verse 3. Um, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I don't think he said go and ignore everybody who, who hurts your feelings. I don't think he said that at all. Let's look more because there, the Bible says has more. And I'm not even going to begin to look at all the different places that the Bible talks about this, because, I mean, we'd be here for many nights. Proverbs uh, chapter 12, verse 16 says this, the, uh, the vexation of a fool is known at once. Or in other words, w when, a, when a fool is upset about something, he vents it. It's got to vent to somebody, right? Their mouth is open. It, it's not hard to know when a fool's upset. 
But the prudent ignores an insult. But the prudent ignores an insult. Do you ever get really, really mad at somebody and just gotta tell somebody? Does somebody ever really make you mad so you have to tell them off? The fool gives full vent to their mouth. <laughs> the wise person ignores the insult. Let it go. Let it go. But they hurt my feelings. See, the Bible doesn't actually condone that kind of an attitude. The Bible never condones a me-centered gospel. Never does that. It, it, it teaches a God-centered gospel. Chapter 29, verse 11 says this. Um, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. Really, uh, uh, just a, uh, a difference there. And I'm not even going to mention about how we believe in ghosts, even though ghosts don't exist. How we believe that Satan has children, even though Satan doesn't really have children. How we believe that Satan is Jesus' arch enemy when he's no more than a fallen angel. Or how we believe that Jesus is less than God when he's fully 100% God. Or the many things that the Bible says about our finances that we choose to ignore. See what I mean? Like, oh God, I don't know how to get out of this financial pickle. Did you read Proverbs? <laughs> Start there and uh, read that a few times and, and, and then, you know, talk with other people who are financially mature. Cut out excess spending. You know, stop spending things on your credit card that you can't afford. You know, don't spend more going out than is coming into your bank account. I mean, things like this, they're all throughout the word that we've chosen to ignore because, well, I don't like that. Well, nobody likes controlling their money. Everybody wants to go out and spend their money on whatever they feel like doing. But that's how you waste your money. <laughs> that's how it happens. So, I mean, these aren't even, I could go on and on about all the things that, that the Bible talks about with our lives. The Bible has a lot to talk about with your life, and if you will read it, God will use it to speak to you. And he will help you to grow, and he will help you to move forward. Okay, So go to that next slide there, buddy. Uh, what, wasn't the Bible written by people? Didn't it change throughout the years? Well, if you're interested, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says this, that no prophecy originated from man, but was from God. None of the prophecies in the Bible originated with man, with man, but was from God. And in what the verse we read at the beginning, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, the Bible is breathed out by God. Scripture is breathed out by God. So no, it did not originate with men. But didn't it change throughout the years? You know, I hear people say this a lot. Did you know that there's not one single shred of evidence that, this, that the Scripture has been changed throughout the years? We have manuscripts from shortly after Jesus' death, and none of them, none of them give us cause for concern. The Old Testament, we have so many copies of the Old Testament, people don't even say how many copies of the Old Testament we have, because we have so many. And they're all consistent. There are minor variations according to different traditions, according to different languages, that kind of stuff. Anybody who knows more than one language knows that there is no one-for-one -one equivalent. That's just how it is. But with that being said, we have a 99% accuracy rate of knowing exactly what the original author said. That means there's only a 1% error of the Bible. And keep in mind that these errors that we have, there is no doctrine that's changed from them. It's things like this. Was it he went with them or he went by them? Things like that. There is no serious doctrine that has changed from this 1% variation. So in other words, did the Bible change throughout the years? No. There is absolutely no evidence that the Bible changed throughout the years. That's something that people tell themselves so that they can get away with not reading the Bible. If you want to know what it actually says, read it. <laughs> it, it it's really that simple. If you cannot afford a Bible, you talk to me and I will get you a Bible. We have spare Bibles here at the church. You don't have to worry about that. What we really care about is that you stay in the Word. Stay in the Word and stay in prayer. Um, so just uh, five quick things. And also, don't forget that the Bible claims to come from God. Don't forget that too. But anyways, um, just five quick things. The first, read the Bible as much as you can. Even if it doesn't make sense, keep reading it. That's yeah. the first point. Um, because as you read it, it'll make more sense. As you keep going, going to church services, as you keep hanging around with Christians, as you keep praying, you keep reading it, it'll make more sense. Okay? You can't read the Bible for the first time and expect to read it like someone who's been reading it for 30 years. Right? Right? If you want to learn the guitar, do you pick it up and you instantly play like a master? No, you pick it up and you practice and you get there, right? 
When you want to learn the Bible, you pick it up and you study it. Number two, understand the Bible is a historic and book, and it, it is literature. It has poetry in it. Some things are meant to be literal. Some things are not meant to be literal. You just have to understand that it is an ancient book, and you have to understand it for what it is. See what I mean? When you're reading Psalms, and you're reading about how the... I'm sorry, that's not in the Psalms. When you're reading the prophets, and you're reading about how the, how the trees clapped their hands, you know that he's not literally saying that trees grew hands and clapped their hands, right? I mean, it's poetical talk. When you read in the book of, uh, of Psalms, and, and you're reading all these things, you realize that those are songs. Okay? They're songs. They're not literal all the time. When you're reading in the book of, of Joshua, and you're reading about how the Israelites went and conquered the Canaanites, that is a literal historical event that actually happened. Right? You have to read the Bible for what it is. It wasn't written yesterday. It was written... Thousands of years ago, and you have to understand it in that light. And if you don't understand it, then get around people who do understand it and learn. We all came from somewhere with learning. Uh, third, go to services, and this will encourage that you continue to grow and be a healthy Christian. If you are if you are trying to be Christian and you separate yourself from all other Christians, this is just not going to help you grow. You 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 go to church services for your own benefit. Honestly, I mean that genuinely. I'm not saying that as a pastor. I'm saying that as a Christian. It is very hard to continue to serve God when you've isolated yourself. Very difficult. You start getting hurt feelings. You start getting weird theology. I mean, just you get out there. Number four, ask the pastor when you don't understand something. Always ask the pastors when you don't understand something. Pastors are always there. One of the main things that pastors jo a pastor's job is from the Bible is that they are there to prevent heresy and false teachings and to teach the word of God. That's one of the big things that the Proverbs, I mean, the Bible continually mentions. So uh, don't forget that. And the last thing, stay in prayer while you stay in the word. If God gave the Bible, then we can know that as we seek him through prayer, we will find the answers in the Bible. So um, I know I went through those last things real quick. I don't want to keep you guys here all night. I don't even know what time it is. So we're going to go ahead and close. If I could have... Uh, Pastor, pray for the service, and then if Joe could pray for the food, can we do that?